<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Guitar Souls podcast. This is episode number 114. And today is going to be an angry one. Me and Mike might actually go 10 rounds. I can see it happening, but that's mm-hmm. fantastic. I am one of your hosts, Mr. Levi Clay, and I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Mike McLaughlin. How's it going, bud? Pussy. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not good. too bad. Good, good. Not too bad. Being pissy online. That's, that's yes. generally speaking my way of my way of doing things. That's, yeah. that's the dream. That is the dream. Being, yes. Yeah. yeah. Nothing nothing major to report. Uh yeah, transcriptions are quietening down finally, which is that that's the dream actually, believe it or not. I, I would like a, a little bit of quietness. That would a, a break. A quiet would, place to reflect. Exactly. A quiet a quiet place to reflect. Play some piano and uh oh, so, so here's an interesting thing. Um from playing my piano I had to have there was a like an electrical problem with it and they sent a repair guy out and they decided the best thing to do would be replace the motherboard. So they replaced the motherboard in my Roland LX705. So an LX705. Um but then I noticed that it sounded weird. It sounded really weird. Like I can hear all these weird overtones and harmonics that shouldn't be there. Um and I'm trying to work out what the hell is wrong with it. And they, they'll they scratch and they had no idea what's wrong with this damn thing. And then I went to connect my Bluetooth and the computer on it, the screen on it, seems to think that it's an LX708. So I, I contacted them and I was like, I think you might have put the wrong motherboard in it. And then they revealed a piece of information to me. They all have the same motherboards. They just then have to be configured once they're, once they're put Different in. Different firmware. Doesn't surprise me. Which is, feels a bit... Uh, Cheeky. Bit cheeky, yeah. Of course it is. But we're a, bit, we're a bit cheeky. Let's be honest, you're not paying for anything more than better software or better management of the software. Yeah. That's that's the truth. If you've already got something that's got weighted keys and filled scale and whatever yeah. else, then that's that's all you're paying for. Yeah. But the fact that those that same that it's the same motherboard that's delivering all of that software and that they're just Oh come on, it doesn't shock you. It wouldn't surprise you if you had the same motherboard in three different iPhones. That's completely fair. It doesn't shock me, it disappoints me. Yes. Be better way of putting it. You pay a lot more for literally just an, a feature to be unlocked. Yeah, which is um But cars have been like that for years too. Yeah, and video games. Lots of things. I have my piano has onboard DLC. That's <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Lateral yeah. pay to play. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it it has really hit me because I I don't play it anymore. I don't want to play it until it gets fixed because it it hmm. it drives me insane. I can hit Melissa can't really hear it, and I'm like, how? It's got all these screaming harmonics, and I'm singing the harmonics that that are there. She's like, just must be my tinnitus range, and I'm like. Well, Lucky bastard. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else to report. We've got a bunch of uh, really cool things to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, we've got some fan mail stuff. We've got some shade to throw. We've got some bases to talk about. We've got some Metallica to talk about. It's going to be a fun show. You guys are going to enjoy it. But, of course, before we get into it, I must tell you something important. Did you know? This show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars. We want to remind you guys that there is still time to get involved in the upcoming Run 16 Guitars. Those include these incredible hypes available in five new colours. That Dragon Burst is absolutely stunning. You can also get your hands on one of the Metal X's, again available in a range of finishes. My personal pick has to be these Headless Vs. Absolutely outrageously cool. Imagine one of those in an 8-string. I absolutely love these. And finally, the Ando San Signature Model, available in 6, 7, and 8-string availability. Go and check them out at Ormsby's website right now. This show is also brought to you by our friends over at Rev Amplification, a one-stop shop for all of your tonal needs. Head on over to their website to check out their range of lunchbox amplifiers, both the D20 and G20, 20-watt 20 amplifiers with built-in two-notes torpedo technology so you can record direct into your computer. If that doesn't suit, you can also check out one of their highly popular G2, 3, and 4 pedals, giving you that trademark Rev tone in a stomp box. Incredible tones, I use these myself. And finally, you may notice in the back of these videos, a Rev Generator 120, an absolute masterclass in modern electric guitar tones. Check it out at their site now. I know everybody must be disappointed by that, right? An ad read right at the start of the show. We want to get that one out of the way and get into the conversation. Uh, We were talking to Perry uh, today. They've got a thousand guitars being delivered this week. So those guys are going to have a a busy week. Yes. Dealing with all of that stuff. Yes. uh, Getting guitars out to people. I've seen some of the shots of the RC1s, the Rusty Coolies. They look incredible. You lucky boy. Yeah, I haven't really seen anything yet, but I've not been online. Yeah, head to, head on in, over to their Instagram page and check out some of the images of some of the stuff they're getting in. Absolutely beautiful. And if anybody has any of those guitars pre-ordered, you will be getting those. Keep your eye on their store. They will be uploading um, additional stock because they always they always order additional stock, right? In case a guitar that somebody has ordered comes in and it's not up to the standard that they wanted to. They've always to got be. spares anyway to sell. Yeah. So 
So uh, there will be a bunch, hopefully, turning up for sale over the coming weeks. And maybe uh, one will be mine. Yeah, maybe maybe one will be mine. Who knows? We, <laughs> yeah, they have some other stuff. Uh, I've asked Perry to send us something else, um, that something something quite unique, which uh, will be a gift. You know, you know what I'm talking about, of course. But I won't reveal too much more about that. It's going to be a gift for somebody out there in the Guitar Souls universe. Mm-hmm. So um, that'll be cool. And uh, yeah, also as usual, big thanks to Rev. Shall we crack on with the show? let's do it baby so i want to start with fan mail stuff okay um the first thing i've had this i actually it looks like we've emailed i've emailed us i was just going to say that's that's your email yeah i was contacted months ago with this information um and i liaised with the person in in question and i've saved the information and saved it and saved it and now is the time to, to to do it so mike take it away sure i'm writing to you in regard to my boyfriend being a huge fan of you and your podcast I myself have grown quite fond of listening to you guys in the morning on our daily drive to work. Eh, sorry, or, uh, no, in the morning on our daily drive to work, sorry. I'll try to keep this message short, but I'd like to provide a little backstory on how amazing my man truly is. Or this man truly is, sorry. Every day, whether minutes or hours, he's always working on growing with music. The happiest moments I see him in is when he's playing guitar or trying to create something new. He's in a small band named The Righteous and Few and working towards a certificate in musical engineering. He's actually taking a lesson right now while I'm writing this to better his knowledge and skills for himself and for the students he teaches. I'm writing you because he recently gave the best birthday present I've ever received. He contacted a producer specialising in EDM to help him create a song for me. He promised me a year ago if it was something he would do and it turned out amazing. It was something he'd never done before so it took some time and hard work so I'd like to pay it forward to him. If there's any way you'd be able to help me make his birthday in July turning 23... Just as great, I would be honoured. Even a small shout out on your podcast or a direct message to him would be amazing. Please contact me if you'd like. If not, I would understand as well. Thank you for your time. And this was from Madison. I did email her back and uh, I said to her, of course, Madison, not a problem. Uh, But you you left out a key detail in that email. You didn't actually tell me your boyfriend's name. (laughs) So we would like to wish a happy birthday to Mr. Kyle McMahon. Is that uh, McMahon? Yeah, it is McMahon. Or McMahon, one of the two. Yeah. Kyle, happy birthday, brother. Big love to you and Maddie. Maddie, that was really nice of you to write in. Very kind. Hopefully this makes his birthday. Big love to you, bud. Yeah, and uh, thanks for listening to the show. As always, tell your friends, tell your enemies, all of that good stuff. And uh, yeah, if if people ever want to be involved in the show like that, or if there's some way that we can help you in the, the way that you guys help us, mm-hmm. you know, just reach out. Um, we are we are happy to do it. Um, because you guys are awesome. We wouldn't have a show without you guys. So, Spoilers. We also had, uh, and trust me, this is there's a lot of information in this oh, one. Oh, I'm not yeah. trying to read that. Yes, but there's some, in, we'll take it in, in sections because it's some stuff about the, the Demacia pickups that we talked about last time. Yes. Uh, we'll skip over this guitar-related question. We'll come back to that another time. And then there was some feedback on, this guy went to the Download Festival, the Download Pilot Festival. I know a few people that did, so it'll be very interesting so, to read this. Yeah, he's definitely got some stories on that. So, take it away. <laughs> Martin. Hi, guys. Long time listener, second time emailer here. I have a couple of things here for you. Some might be interesting, others not so much, so apologies for the long-winded email. Feel free to pick and choose as to whether any of this is worth your time. It's always worth our time, Martin. Don't be silly. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much yet again for writing in. You're always yeah. in the chat as well. Um, Demarzio, and that's for the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club. Get, make sure you're there. I'm not going to be there. I'll be at work. But make sure you're there. <laughs> like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. I'll be there. <laughs> you will. Uh, Demarzio, pick up colours. I just listened to episode 113 and the conversation around DiMarzio pickups and I can hopefully speak on this to some level of expertise as someone who spent over 10 years working with large corporate brands on packaging and branding. In terms of companies trademarking colours, this is something which 100% happens. However, Levi's speculation on this was absolutely correct. A company like Coca-Cola owns a trademark on red and white and Cadbury's owns a similar one on purple and cream, for example. However, they own a trademark on extremely specific colour tones. These are called Pantone colours. And have a code defining a very specific colour. Uh, that was the um, what I was kind of referencing yeah. last time. When I, I, I don't think that's the six digits, but it's the same idea. Sure. And I, I've heard Pantone being used for describing ex- exact colours before. Yeah. Um, they are the industry standard for physical colours, printed or plastic colours, not on a TV or a screen. Based on my experience, trademarks in the UK are only ever granted for a specific field of business. So, for example, Coca-Cola Red is trademarked as Pantone whatever, this means that any other brand of soft drink using that specific colour on their packaging is potentially committing trademark infringement. Fender could release a guitar using the exact colour without fear of a lawsuit as guitars are not seen to be sharing a market with soft drinks. Large companies spend a fortune each year making sure the colours on their cans, plastic and cardboard packaging etc are all tightly controlled for this exact reason. 
and I have seen entire lorry loads of packaging rejected by the manufacturers of products for these brands and returned to the printers for not meeting the specified colour standards. I'm going to add something in there. I've actually mentioned this on the show before, uh, but when I was at music school in music business class, when we were talking about copyright trademark and things like that, um, the case study that we were given or, or pointed out to is the band All Saints mm-hmm. um, never never had uh, merchandise that said All Saints on their shirts. Because, because of the clothing line? Because range? of the clothing line, All, All Saints. So they, unfortunately, they could never secure a trademark to, to market their, their brand on a, on a T-shirt. But that falls in line with that. You know, They could release plenty of other merchandise that said All Saints on it, but not... Clothing, not the not t shirts and I know like stuff that. that falls into fashion. That's yeah. fair enough, I so. so as for DiMarzio, I can't see their trademark as being enforceable should anyone want to go back in court. Unless they are taking about a specific or sorry, unless they're talking about a specific colour or range of colours which can be accurately measured, most likely via the Pantone system, then I don't think they have a leg to stand on. I think they're reliant on fear of the expense involved in challenging in court to maintain their position. The equivalent to this would be if Coca-Cola tried to sue Red Bull for using red on their cans. They could only sue for a specific shade of red used in conjunction with white and black or whatever the specifics of the trademark states. You can definitely make a soft eh, sorry, a soft drink with red on the packaging without fear of being sued as Coca-Cola on a very specific palette of colours. Companies like Aldi, for example, are notorious for skirting around this by copying the branding of large companies but changing it enough not to get sued. These are all famous examples of exceptions to this. Or sorry, there are famous examples of exceptions to this. And I could get into loads more detail on exactly how these colour standards and trademarks are used and applied to different types of products. But I shall spare you the boredom <laughs> since it's nothing to do with guitars. Yeah. Still? Uh, so Interesting. It, great piece of information. And um, someone else made a, a, a really fantastic point um, on YouTube. Because, of course, we're reading YouTube comments as well. Um, mm-hmm. So Travis Heath wrote in and added to the discussion on this one with... DiMarzio makes pickups of every colour now, so the idea of cream being synonymous with the company is ludicrous. It's like if UPS drivers were wearing different colour uniforms and driving around in different coloured trucks, but still trying to defend their brown colour as being copyrighted. Travis, that's a fucking glorious point. You know, the idea of cream being synonymous with, with DiMarzio, would, I would defend them on that if they only made cream pickups. Yep. But they make any colour that you want. So to make absolutely anything, and I don't even know if, you know, maybe if they offer every colour but still 60% of their pickups are cream. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that the majority of DiMarzio's pickups are probably black. You know, I would imagine that most of the stuff yeah. they sell is probably just straight black. Would so, not surprise me. You know, to try and be defending uh, ownership of a colour when you use every other colour available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just seems like incredibly shitty. Um, so I did want to did want to bring that up and um, thank thank those guys Martin and Travis um, for for your input on that and I can't believe that I missed Travis's point you know when I was talking about it last time because it's such an obvious thing to point oh, out and um, it's a total yeah. bell to a point totally totally nails the, the point down and I and I did kind of make this point to Martin when I emailed him back just saying um, you know I wonder how Coca Cola's trademark and and ownership of red and cream or white. That's white, isn't it? Red and white <clears throat> would stand up if if you could buy Coca Cola in you know a hundred different color variants, you know, and they, and red and white was maybe even the minority, and yeah, I, I just don't think it would don't think it would stand up. But of course, nah. we're not lawyers, so uh, of course not. We shouldn't we shouldn't pretend to be. <laughs> oh, we should. It's, it's good fun. Um, so I <laughs> I did email Martin back and say uh, you're right, it's a long email, but good stuff. So I'd actually love to. Um, love it to be longer so tell us more a little bit a little bit more about download so um but you yeah. want me to read the first part uh no it's really, no. It's really okay yeah. so download pilot festival entry at the festival in order to attend you had to buy a ticket obviously which i thought was pretty reasonably priced at 130 pounds only weekend tickets were available you could only buy one ticket as the name of the ticket needed to match your id which you had to produce at the gate to get in if you purchased a ticket you had the option to reserve one ticket for a friend for two hours in that case, a code was sent to you which you could forward on to your lucky friend and if they followed the link, they could also buy one of the reserved tickets. I did see people sharing those about trying to help each other. Yeah. Um, once you'd bought a ticket, you were posted two PCR tests, one of which you had to complete on the Friday and post the same day. The other needs to be done on Friday this week and posted off. You also had to do a lateral flow test and show your results as being negative along with your ticket and ID to get through the gate. Once you were through the gate, you could remove your mask and there were no social distancing measures at all. So back to life as we knew it. I mean, that sounds pretty good. It does sound pretty good, but also bizarre because even if you're, uh, even if you're, you test negative and if you're vaccinated, you can still carry and transmit. Yeah, you so. can be asymptomatic. Yeah. Um, the good things. 
Unlike a normal large festival, there was no arena at the site, just one big fenced off area. Eh, sorry, as the site was just one big fenced off area. The great thing about this is you could take your own foot and drink to the stages with you, and there were no huge walks to get around as the site was much smaller. That is the entire problem with download. Yeah. Entire problem. Yeah. The year they changed it from being on the track to having to go round the track. Yeah. Were you there? 2007, maybe? No, I, well, I went Eight? before. I was there before that and, and there after that. I did a video complaining about download because we got um, RIP, which is like the download equivalent of VIP camping type thing. Uh -huh. It's not really, it's rest in peace because it's a no noise campsite. Mm -hmm. um, and you can Long. park your car next to your. Uh, next to your tent that's right which is just just ideal but you know for the privilege of that you're even fucking further away from the arena and m more importantly you're even like you're an impossible distance away from the village so if you want to actually go up and get involved in the things that happen in the night time it's just it's just not worth it how do you expect them to give you a rest and peace area that's not further away from a open live music event oh so it's pro no to be, to be fair it's probably you know, it's a minor, um, a minor distance difference between the regular camping and the arena versus the RIP in the arena. Uh huh. Uh, minor difference, but it, it's no noise after I think midnight, so the music isn't going to be an issue any yeah. anyway. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, it was just nice to be to be able to sleep somewhere and not be in fear that your tent was going to be set fire during the night. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shite bag. I know, that's if you don't you turn for. up to a festival <laughs> and a, with a twenty quid single skin tent. The cheapest sleeping bag you can get a hold of, and yeah. potentially a yoga mat for lying on, yeah. if you're feeling really, really adventurous and cool, and you want to look after your spine, then your quads in. It wasn't necessarily that it was so far away from the uh, from the village that bugged me. It was that you had to um, you would leave the RIP centre, you would then walk through essentially the arena, but skirting around the outside, mm -hmm. and to get to the to the village, and you spend your time there, and then you you come back. Not too bad during the day, but if you go at night time and you stay in the village until it closes and then you want to go home, well, at that point, the arena area is closed. So there's no way for you to get back other than walking all the way around on the main road. Oh, my God. And the main, roads, enough, yeah, the main roads don't have any pavements or lights. And I've also, we didn't know how the hell to even get there. And nobody that we seemed to walk past knew which way we should be going. So we were essentially lost in the dark for a good solid hour. And yeah, it was a, it was a bad experience. So. Yeah, fuck that. that um, anyway, terrible. carry on. <laughs> That sounds really, really bad. Um, some people were probably camping within 50 metres of the stages, which was amazing. That's crazy. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to, you could watch the headliner sound check since the stages were never closed off. Despite being able to bring your own food and drink, the shops and stalls all seemed to do well. We chatted to a few of the food stall owners and bar staff, and they were all pleased with how much business they were getting. The other excellent thing was that since there were only two stages and stage times were staggered, you could theoretically watch every single band on the lineup. I really like this. That's what uh, Hellfest does with the two main stages. Yeah. I really like this as I ended up watching a whole load of bands that I would never normally have checked out. Usually the two main stages are filled with the big American bands like Metallica, Slipknot, Korn, so it was excellent to see UK bands being given a platform on the big stages for a change. I can't imagine a band like Enter Shikari being given the headlining slot on the main stage normally. I don't know as much. Like, yeah, Enter Shikari are a like, festival and arena selling band. Yeah. Um, Maybe not these days yeah. as much, but somebody like a. Uh... They wouldn't be a headliner, but they would be a decent slot on the main stage. Aye. Uh, what band is Ollie Sykes on again? Pure pop. Used to be a hardcore band. You know the name. Bring Me the Horizon. Bring Me the Horizon. That's exactly the I name. don't know who Ollie Sykes is, but then is I just singer? had to. I just Real threw a name out. That was perfect. <laughs> you couldn't have done that if you tried. Um, the bad things. Very few complaints, really. The toilets got a bit busy at times, but hey, that's standard festival life. If you remember the long drops from being a download festival when you were younger, i.e. the porter cabins that were basically just a, like a chemical bath and then 12 raised holes in a bit of metal that you sat on, <laughs> you, you won't complain about toilets, man. They were the worst smelling thing in the world. And I remember one year when I was down there, someone swimming through that saying they were the poo monster. <laughs> yeah. Another reason nah. I went for the RIP camping. Yes. Lovely because... toilets. Showers with warm water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not waking up to 23 degrees in a single skin tent, hung over, out your dish, dying, hating it, no water, no food, haven't ate properly, uncomfortable, slept like shit, sweating your pan in, and the first thing that happens when you open your tent is that you smell what must be the, the closest smell to putrid, rotting death. <laughs> Chemicals and shit and sick and piss and blood and anything else that could be thrown down there. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Oh, um, I'm gutted I missed staying in there. 
get me back. Yeah. Uh, there also weren't any toilets in the campsites, so you had to keep going over to where the stages were. But given the significantly smaller site, this wasn't a huge problem. As I mentioned in my earlier email, there were some minor technical problems on the Saturday. My friend was at the front of house engineer, or sorry, was the front of house engineer for a band called Yonaka. When all the sound cut out mid song, as about three songs on their set. When everything went off, you just had to, the live drum sound and the noise from the cabs on stage left, and obviously no vocals as the PA words down. Sorry, I'm really struggling to read this because I'm late. It's because I'm old. The band kept playing till the end of the song, though, like true professionals, until some unfortunate stagehand had to go on and tell them about the problem, although I'm sure they will have noticed. I talked to my mate later and he said the fuse cut out on the generator powering the front of house equipment, so they had to pull out all the power cables and swap them onto a different generator. In fairness, this was sorted in about a minute and didn't seem to put much of a dampener on things. Fair play, at least you've got some sort of business continuity in place, especially for a festival. Uh, the bands. Almost everyone in the lineup was great. I'll come back to the almost in a second. <laughs> Me and my girlfriend were there mainly to see Enter Shikari, and so we are biased, but they absolutely are they but they absolutely were absolutely incredible. Uh, they had an insane light show, huge explosions of confetti and streamers, and they played all of the hit songs you would want to hear from them. The crowd went absolutely insane for them, and I saw a lot of Enter Carry t-shirts around the site all weekend. Skindred were also fantastic. I've seen them before, I've been lucky enough to play, supporting them at a local show, but they really worked the crowd so well. They had loads of funny banter and crowd participation bits to get the crowd really amped up, and did their Newport helicopter bit. Search that on YouTube if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't, but I'm going to have a look. <laughs> uh, of the other bands, While well, She Sleeps were really good. The frontman did a magic, a magical manoeuvre halfway through the set where he disappeared from the stage and appeared again hanging off the scaffolding at the top of the sound desk, which was cool. A were really good and very good at having a laugh with the crowd. Lotus Eater, Loathen, Employed to Serve were all bands I'd never heard before and I really enjoyed their stuff. I would imagine Lotus Eater, Loathen, Employed would have been class to see. Sure. Built for My Valentine were also excellent. They're not normally my cup of tea, but they sounded huge and closed out the weekend nicely. Almost every band told the crowd how happy and appreciative they were to see everyone, and you could see it in their performances. I buy that, yeah. I think so, I. Now, time to throw some shade at the only two bands I really didn't get along with. Pardon me. <laughs> One was St. Agnes. Halfway through their set, the singer goes off stage and swaps guitar. I actually commented to my girlfriend I was confused as to why she was playing, as it was a Squire strap worth all of 150 quid. A minute later I get my answer when she smashes it into a tiny little into a tiny little Marshall combo amp. I just thought it was a bit stupid and they're trying really hard to be edgy and rock and roll when actually they probably broke two hundred pound worth of gear. It was all a bit like they were trying too hard. I mean, it definitely sounds like it, doesn't it? Like yeah. it's performative punk rather yeah. than just being like, fuck it, something's getting smashed. Yeah. I mean it, play the whole set on a two hundred pound guitar and it, it just doesn't destroy the illusion then, you know? Mm. Um, I don't like the idea of a, 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 a scheduled guitar destruction thing like nah. it's part of the set. Um, nah. But if you are going to do it, you 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 want to keep that illusion there up. And going off to switch it out for a cheap guitar, it just completely undermines the whole point of the smashing of the guitar. So, yeah. Cringe. I think people also probably knew what was happening, which yeah, not good. Oh, there she's... Okay. Uh, this is what's happening next then. Yeah. Um, the award <laughs> for cunts. Oh. of the festival definitely goes to the Wild Hearts in my book. I don't know if there was problems behind the scenes or what was going on, but they played about two songs, at which point the singer stops mid-song and announces the entire crowd that he's not happy with his monitors and that he wants more guitar and vocals. They move on to the next song, and the whole time the lead guitarist is angrily shouting at someone off stage, presumably the tech in charge of monitors, and pointing, asking for more guitar. The crowd are pretty baffled as everything sounds good from out front of house. This goes on for a couple more songs, at which point the singer says something to the effect of I'm sorry, it sounds so shit for all of you out there. This is a complete waste of time. And they all walk off stage with 15 minutes left of their set. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but to me that is petulant childish behaviour. I've played loads of gigs and sometimes the sound in the monitors isn't exactly ideal. The idea that you would declare to a crowd of 10,000 people that you're not happy with the sound, effectively slagging off the whole crew and then walk off stage at one uh, of the first music festivals back in 18 months is mind-boggling to me. Also, just because the sound in the monitors isn't quite what you want, that has no impact on what it sounds like out front, especially on a stage that big. It sounded good out front of house. Not only that, how much do you really need to hear in the monitors to play four chord punk songs? Okay, that one was a cheap shot, but you get what I'm saying. It was just unbelievable to me that they would do that. Yonaka had a complete power failure and just smiled and carried on, but the monitors not being ideal was sufficient for the Wild Hearts to have a t hissy fit and walk off stage. Safe to say that you couldn't pay me to go see the Wild Hearts from now on. Cool. 
Right, I think that's everything I can think of. Sorry for the length of the rant about the wild hearts, but they honestly can go fuck themselves. We all know there's nothing more punk rock than being a happy with or than being happy with your monitors. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of what the festival was like. Thanks very much. That's quite a lot of information. And I fuck the wild hearts. I don't know how many gigs I've played where we don't have any sort of front of house. <laughs> like, well, there's a PA system, but nothing like a like no fallback. Sure. Nothing. Who gives a fuck? Who cares? Go yeah. on with it. Yeah. Do you have your full system set up when you're in your fucking practice studio? I mean, maybe the World Hearts do, but get a fucking grip. Yeah. A band that big, you'd imagine they should have in-air monitors anyway. Um, I guess the way I would look at that is... Um, I, can, I can get it. Like, If you've been promised a certain expectation in terms of the sound that you'll be getting on stage and then you turn up and it turns out that your, um, that your sound check is in front of the audience... Um, more of a line check than a sound check that's never the best feeling so I'll, I'll give them that but at the same time like that's how it was when you started yeah. and you loved it then yeah. get a fucking grip yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, and, excuse me. and if the fear is if you if you stop playing because you don't want to deliver a subpar product to the audience you don't want to sell them short you think that selling them short of 15 minutes of music that they paid for and potentially were looking forward to is better <laughs> no not at all Fucking this, as pointed out, this is the first opportunity that almost everybody at that show has had to see live music for 18 fucking months, right? They would have been happy if all of your amps died and you still stood there and strummed your fucking hearts out acoustically. 100%. So, um, yeah, shitty move, shitty move. Uh, and I know so that was like, a long email, but thank you for sending it in. It was a good one. Have you seen the video of uh, Jack White when they cut him off at the end of a song or whatever and he just gets the crowd to sing? <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking tremendous, man. Like yeah. the full venue's just like, no, we're keeping going. Yeah. Really cool. Um, okay, so let's throw some shade. Uh, I posted this. You know, I really, I, I want to preface this by saying when I posted this on Facebook, I didn't like this. I didn't want to do this. Of course not. And when I posted, I actually felt bad about it because it, although Michelangelo Battio is infinitely bigger in terms of his career than I ever will be, at this stage, it really does feel like punching down, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's only so many times you can steal a Lamborghini, aren't there? But the other aspect that goes with it is like, so I posted a video of I saw Michelangelo Battio done a version of Superstition with uh, Jamie Rose Schneider as the singer. It was actually her single with him featuring him as a lead thing, but it was released on his channel, um, and it was dire. Like uh, uh, if it starts, it's questionable. Yeah, and you, I want people to know that like if this was just Jamie Rose Schneider's band, like a, a local band that just released this, like obviously I'm not going to poke fun at something like that. You know, if your dad's in a band and you send me a clip of your dad in a band. I'm not talking about your dad. No, fuck it. Yeah, if your dad's dad. in a band and he's, and he's mate, I think if my mum or my dad started doing music, ever would be blown at the water. <laughs> my dad's going to appear getting it, <clears throat> just being like the best death metal vocalist you've ever heard at fifty odd. But if you sent me uh, like videos of your dad in a band playing in a local pub, right, and it was it was shit, I'm not going to make fun of that. You know, you maybe he's... make fun to me, but you certainly wouldn't be out in public going like a fucking state of this. Yeah, because I don't want to discourage people from going out and playing music. If you love music then go out and play music like that and i'll never make fun of you for that but i went for this specifically for two reasons because it's michelangelo batio you know big name big name on the guitar scene and because of this sick need to just be nice about everything when it's garbage and dilute the dilution of music that comes from that if you read the comments on that video every single comment is like ridiculous levels of praise like this is the best version of the song that i've ever heard and and really this is fucking stevie wonder song like right stevie wonder doesn't do bad music and stevie wonder well okay ebony and ivory um happy birthday he's got a lot of songs that i don't like but he's stevie fucking wonder right it doesn't matter whether you like it or not it's the same as the beatles man you have to accept yeah. the validity of it the fact that the people behind it the person behind it is so prolific they're yeah. allowed to have one or two wee gaffes because they're still sure. good songs they're just yeah. maybe not your taste yeah exactly so I, I i i don't want i fear that people are going to watch this and actually forget have watered down jesus christ have, wa have watered down just how fucking good stevie wonder's version of that tune is Boy. or just how good a good version of that tune is how you good should stevie be wonder to, is. Yeah, you should be able to tell the difference between a shit version of a cover of a tune and an excellent cover of a tune yes and this was not a good cover for multiple reasons you listen to it and actually i'm gonna throw shade at the guitar players not in the video the guitar players that responded to my video guys there is so much fucking more to music than guitar tone 
everybody was listening to that and every single person was going oh that's the worst tone i've ever heard and it's like sure but that's not the biggest the most offensive thing on that track before the guitars even come in the drums have no groove whatsoever it's, it's the like, vocals have been tuned to fuck it's just like the it's the whitest version of superstition that's ever fucking happened everything is a been kkk quantized. anthem <laughs> jesus christ that's a bit far um <laughs> No, you're right, though. Like, That's a bit far, right? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Yeah. Hey, I didn't make that. I didn't do the cover. So. Yeah, I didn't do the cover. I keep that hand down. Whoa. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you try to get some demonetized here. I mean, thrown I, off. I, I demonetize all our videos anyway. So ah, it's yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I just mean deplatformed. <laughs> um, no, I get what you're saying. It sounds like, like almost like they've, they've all went in and done the the heart's best in the studio and then went right cool where we've failed computers work click quantize click auto tune click fucking automatically generate guitar tone with the sounds it as well the point you made about the auto tune thing when you pointed out talking about this this screenshot bring, here yeah, I'll bring I'll bring this up um so this was actually most... posted on Jamie Rose Schneider's Instagram page yep uh it's there and it's definitely the most valid I'll move that out of the way jeez oh the, the, the most valid comment I've seen yet. Like, if you look at where it's been auto-tuned, she's quite clearly been very close to the notes as is. Yes. And all the auto-tune's really done is rein in any natural sound of your voice yeah. and then where the vibrato yeah. widens at the end of passages, which is what you would expect yep. when people are singing, um, especially when they're singing songs where they're holding notes for longer. You find that the vibrato either stays yeah. super tight or it expands. But if you look at this with any, any degree of information or a sense, you can see that it probably was a much better vocal take before they tuned it. Yeah, it's um, or that, or even just they're just over I'd even go, f- I'd go further than that. I'd say it was probably a reasonably good vocal take. That's before, what I mean. Before they tuned it, so um, even if they'd done the auto tune and then cut it in a layer underneath the actual vocals, just to give that tiny wee bit more tune. Yeah. Fair enough. Plenty yeah. of people do that. Yeah. But yeah, that's... and I think that's that's what it really reeks of to me. It's the it's a inexcusably bad production. The performance we can let's just ignore the performance. The performance is bad, but the the production is awful. I'm ninety nine yeah, percent convinced that Michelangelo uh, is using like a digital, whatever digital rig that he's using for that, mm-hmm. um, and he doesn't have a cab simulator. Uh, right? He's definitely using one of his sawtooth amps. Yeah, <laughs> one of his flagship hundred and twenty yeah. watt solid state heads that are probably like a rebranded Harley Benton. Yeah. Uh, but it's being recorded digitally and there is an absolutely no way there's a cab sim on that. I think there could be. I think it's probably just a really, 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 <laughs> really, really bad amp sound. And in fact, you know what? I would need to listen to it again to, to discern whether I believe it's just a horrendously miked fuzzy, buzzy, shitty amp. Or if it is what you say, just like a, a drive pedal. Give me the headphones. Are we doing it? Are we doing it? Well, while we're speaking about really bad covers, uh, I had a memory come up on my Facebook for four years ago when George Henry, shout out to big Yorgo, uh, filled in for Party Can on drums for us to play in Portugal. And we decided to do a cover of, well, part of the set we did a cover of Dying Fetus. Mm-hmm. Uh, pissing in the mainstream we decided in the studio for a laugh to try and do it double time. <laughs> and the video is ridiculous, man. It must be... Broaching 400 brake, uh, 400 brake horsepower, 400 BPM. You drive too many cars now, uh, mate. I wish. I really wish. Um, I'd love to drive cars. It's even worse than good headphones. Every time I think There's got to be no cab on that, man. Uh, oh. There can't be a cab on that. It sounds. Who, who edited this? I no idea. Like they're just a random zooming in of a shaky, terrible shot in the camera. Yeah. I, I love that it's the official oh. music video, and what they mean by that is a shot with two iPhones. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't even say they were iPhones, man. I don't know what the fuck they filmed that shit yeah. on. It's just, and I guess the other thing that's a that's a problem with something like this is when when people hear this, this is what a boomer thinks shredding is. <laughs> And they'd be right, because there are tons of guys out there that do this. Like, oh, let's just shred really inappropriate nonsense over a Stevie Wonder track that has no groove. Look at the tags. What? Michelangelo Batio, Speed Kills, World's Fastest Guitar, MAB, and then... A bunch uh, of kanji. Uh, just... Uh, yeah. Uh, 
And uh, thanks for stopping by. Check out, check out the song and add it to your playlist below. And check it out. On no, 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 no. Yeah. To quote Melissa. Yeah. And the- <laughs> Fucking no! The thing I really enjoy uh, pointing out in this is um, it's like she heard Stevie Wonder's performance and gone, oh, look, Stevie's just really out of time. She doesn't understand what syncopation is. Stevie's really out of time with this. So I'll correct it for him. So instead Baby of... superstitious. So she's not quite that bad, but on the on the uh thirteen month old baby, right? Stevie is da 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 da. She literally sings da 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 do da do. Oh, she sings the last bit. Thirteen month old baby, baby. It's not good, is it? Fucking kill me now. It's just I feel bad because. Clearly, she's got a nice voice, or could have a nice voice, well, by, we, the, by the looks of that picture. But we've not actually heard her voice because that first line that comes in is sure. Ah, 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 it may as well be a synth. Yeah, we uh we did check out a little clip of her on Instagram doing some of her other stuff, and you know she's she's not bad. She's not bad at all. I think the problem was that the, there was such a stark contrast between the two tracks. One so overproduced, and the other one was fairly underproduced. Yeah. Other than a bit of reverb. Yeah. No. I don't know if you, what kind of processing you put in a voice to make it sound better, yeah. other than making it sound synthy, which is yeah. where they've went too far. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> hmm, I I had to draw attention to it because it's uh, I don't want. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I do take issue with this, right? So, for there are some people out there that did take issue with the fact that I posted like quite a scathing thing on Facebook, and you know, oh, bringing such negativity in the world, like, well, why do you have to do stuff like this? But I have to point out that when I when I posted that, uh, it has. Is it? it has received 120 comments yeah 120 comments uh the day before or maybe even earlier that day i posted a link to melissa's new video of her doing um aretha franken's uh, natural woman mm-hmm. which is great oh baby what you done to me yeah you made me feel so good single comment absolutely fucking nothing so it's like, like all those people that that post on my chapman videos or things like that or the stevie t videos where they're like why do you think people care about this and it's like well you can play that card all you want but the reality is you you do care because you click stuff like this and you engage in stuff like this and i don't want to do stuff like this but i am forced to do stuff like this because it's the only way i can get that oh so needed attention that i desperately crave <laughs> So, yeah, I wouldn't do shit like this if you checked out all the good stuff that I post. So, um, yeah, go and check out the, the good stuff that I post. You fucking pricks! Yeah. Shall we move on and talk just briefly about Rings of Saturn? Yes, let's do it. Go on, tell me the story. What, that the Black Dahlia murder are touring with Rings of Saturn and Viscera's support and that the Black Dahlia, are, or sorry, uh, Rings of Saturn are going to have a vocalist on the tour? Yes. Is that what it's going to be? Well, yeah. I actually reached out to Mike Caputo about this, personally. Mike being... Mike's the drummer Okay. Yep. for Rings of Saturn. Um... I think he was sharing drum duty with Lord Marco. Right. But Mike's pretty much the live band main pick. Um, So, as it says here, we're going completely instrumental, but Peter's joining us for the tour. So I actually sent a message to Mike just saying, like, I thought you guys were going to be going without a vocalist for now. And his reply was very good. It was on our last post about that. We said we offered Ian the opportunity to do the last few tours if he'd like. If not, it was no hard feelings. He opted out, so Peter is stepping in for this one. Kind of fitting since he... uh, Since the last... uh, Sorry. Kind of fitting, in my opinion, since the Embryonic Anomaly remake with Peter on it was the last thing that came out. It'd be a nice little treat for fans. So I, Fair enough. Yeah, I um, I see that. But then if you're actually going to argue that this will be a nice treat for fans, then you're suggesting or you're, or you're saying that playing the music that the fans like with the vocalist is a treat for them. So we're going to do away with that vocalist. Moving well, forward, we're going to do away with the vocalist. Is that a treat for fans? Depends what fans are, aren't it? Like, I, I, now would be a great time to find out. Well, we're going to find out 
after those two of us balls, isn't it? Yeah. Lucas did come up with, uh, hey, thanks for all our past labels and all that have done the band. However, I feel that DIY is the way to go for Rings of Saturn's future and that DIY is also truly the future of music for modern artists as a whole. Uh, I agree with that sentiment, but it depends how you go about it. Yeah, that's just it just contradicts how you've carried yourself for your, you know, your entire career. Not you. <laughs> but part of the academy as well be as DIY as we can fucking get. You didn't leave your label. You were dropped by your label. For trying to threaten them. Yeah. So um yeah. All right, Lucas, you keep you keep trying to trying to cope, bro. Uh Mike also wants to hang out when he comes over. So they're playing Glasgow the twenty second of February. Uh huh. So there's every chance we'll end up at the show. If you can behave. I can't behave. I know. So we'll probably I hang mean, out with Mike and then be like, right, have a good show, mate. I'm not taking this asshole in with me. Yeah. <laughs> it's look, it's not that I can't behave, it's that I am uh, not popular among Rings of Saturn fans, you know, the reality is it. Or Lucas Mann, exactly. So I don't know if there's Lucas Mann post about how he no, does annoy you quite a lot, mate. Lucas Mann, in theory, if Lucas Mann's anything other than uh, a liar, Lucas Mann should be my biggest fan because he constantly tells people how he steers into controversy. He wants controversy. Controversy is how he markets his band. Okay. So we have been a positive marketing tool in by his own standard. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair yeah. enough. So he he must love us. Must be a big fan. Um, big fan. Must be. Um, and if he's not, then he's a liar. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. You're just twisting the guy to bits. But that's fair enough. I mean, there have been plenty of reasons to do so in the past. Also, this is called the guitar souls, and the word arsehole is right there in it. So, um... Oh, but that's just talking about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get on. That's yeah. obviously both ears. No, I, do, I, I might... Um... Twist you into it a little bit, but that's okay. Um, that's fun. I, you know, you're definitely going to twist it when we get to the main story. Oh, yeah. Um, because I sent it to you, and we started arguing right away, and you're like, stop, stop fucking messaging me. Yeah. Leave it for the fucking show. And I'm like, right, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so let's just briefly mention Dark Glass Electronics. Of course, Dark Glass, very uh, well known for their uh, their pedals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, making incredible uh, bass sounds that you hear from guys like Nolly, as a big fan. Um I Great. don't think there's very many modern bands that don't either use a ding wall with the dark glass tone capsule preamp installed, right. or that there isn't a dark glass pedal or even the amps in the rig. Yep. And there's also a, a plug in version of the Oh yep. Of the dark glass, which I use. So on, on bass tones. Tremendous, like the great, great and innovative yeah. actually pedals yeah the fact that there are some of them that have got an active crossover where below a certain frequency things will be clean and above a certain frequency things can be distorted and yeah. the ability to blend that it's just it's fucking clever yeah. is the best way to put it yeah they have teamed up with uh any ball to release some bases with dark glass uh preamps in them and for some reason they're running it through a galleon trigger in that last photo uh you know, these might appeal to some people. Very strange choice. They are only available in four-string models. They look really good. That, that is fucking weird. They look really good. Mm, for what we listened to, I didn't think the demos were fantastic. Certainly not the opening track of the demo, but I don't know if that was meant I mean, to, to be, be fair, the I can extremes. Click, I can click play on that and let people hear that. This is a cool trick. I'm going to show oh, you how... Go away, Charlie Puth. You'll not get fucking copyright struck for that, will you? No. No, it's just he's constantly advertising to me. Charlie? Charlie's a man. Don't let Levi catch you on. Not the worst. Michelangelo dialed that tone in. It's not the best tone. Say again? It's not the best tone. No, it's not. It really... That could be a cool tone if he was playing uh, Anesthesia for one piece. Yeah. As you go through it and you check out some of the actual tones. I mean, I think it's a usable tone. You could probably use that. I like a lot of the blue drive tones. Because like the blues are distorted and the reds fuzz. Is that right? Some of the lighter ones. It does sound good too. That's like some of I think... Uh... So from clean to... I think it's a pretty usable tone in a kind of 
rock mix. Not playing like this. <laughs> I would love to hear Jaco Pistorius with distortion on the bass. Yeah. Can you imagine a fucking weather report with him ripping up a fucking dark glass amp? I think that's a really good tone so there. The two that things was, that matter. I think uh, if you were using that, you know, um, Mildly with fuzzy. a pick uh, for for low end chug in a in a rock band, yep. I think there's going to be a really cool tone there. But as I say, I do think it's a very questionable choice that these are only available in four strings. I think most of the market that these are going to appeal to would probably rather have them as five strings. I would say so. And therefore, the market that's interested in dark glass products probably won't pick these up. I think it's going to be a different market, which is good for dark glass, right? I think it's going to be, you know, the bass player in in the fucking, uh, that Michelangelo video. He's likely to pick one of these up, right? And maybe mm -hmm. find some cool tones. Mm -hmm. Do his best to copy Michelangelo's tone. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely potential. I don't think that they are for the market that we maybe um, are in. I could also see, you know, if you're really influenced by like Muse mm -hmm. um, and you want some of uh, Chris's, Chris yeah, yeah. Um, if you want some of Chris's inspired sound, you could probably, you know, get some get some cool stuff out of these. There's no doubt it'll be mega, mega uh, flexible and applicable in lots of different places. I, my problem was that the first part of the demo just doesn't do it justice, I don't think. And that's not a criticism on the player or whatever. I just, I think the tones themselves they've chosen are just a bit... Yeah. Um, overly raw. Maybe that was part of it. I don't know. Could, I could be on the wrong. Tell me about the Metallica Blacklist. So this is something that's been going on for quite some time, supposedly. Yeah. A lot of artists recording it. I did hear months ago... We saw that Miley Cyrus was That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, we saw like, that Elton John was doing something with Metallica. Just funny enough, the same song, the same yeah. cover. Oh, okay. Um, have you looked through it? I know. Essentially... Couldn't care less. The, Meta <laughs> I know. the Metallica Blacklist is a load of bands who have been opted to choose any song from Blackened, or the Black, Black album, album, sorry, yeah. not Blackened, the Black <laughs> album, um, to do a cover of, and basically Metallica are selling this as the Blacklist box set, so you can buy a re-release of the album, I think it's a remaster, of the original Black album, or you can get a box set that's got both in, or you can just buy the other one. Um, it's, what, 53 artists, 12 songs, quite a lot, but... When it says 12 songs, what they mean is there are 12 songs in the original album, but there are multiple copies of those songs done originally yeah. by the artists. And some of it is fucking bizarre. There's like one or two where I was like, I, I need to hear that. Mm. And the majority, I'm like, uh, probably not that bothered. Um, You've got different pricing for what I sent you, which was really interesting. Actually, let me find it on my phone. So on HMV, you can pick up the Metallica Blacklist. The Blacklist. This is a four CD box set, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. four, four CDs. You can buy that for thirty pounds. Um, I, you can pre-order it digitally on Amazon for fifty-three pounds, I believe. See, that's what I think I was, I was thinking of yeah. when, when I looked at it. Whatever the link was, that was that. It was like a, a physical copy of it. Yeah, was cheaper than buying the download. Yeah, I, I, I don't get that. Like, you can also buy a, a 12 inch vinyl box set for £160. To be fair, it's like what? Eight vinyls? Yeah. So um, let me see if I can find the list. I'm going to bring them up. Bring, oh, them I bring up. up. Bring up the order and I'll. I'll... So yeah, it's four CD for £20, £173 for the vinyl. Uh, yeah. Bring it up like this. Uh, that seems to be the only options here. Um, it was an American link I had up that was showing me the downloads were more expensive, sure. so maybe that's where I've got it. Or maybe the download was more expensive because it had both the covers Blacklist album and the physical re-release. Okay. So, I could be guessing. Okay, so the Black Album uh, Remastered is that, yeah, it's a separate product. Black Album Remastered 3D Expanded Edition and then the Blacklist is a different album so you can't buy them both unless you buy the big box set okay so the right. uh, yeah the... celebrate the Black Album your way on September 10th I will I won't listen to this or Blacklist <laughs> thank you uh, do you want to bring up the playlist of all the artists and I'll quickly read some stuff out yes it, uh, I mean it's, it, it's, I it, it is a ridiculous list there is no how on earth am I going to do this uh, it's in the trailer I believe or there's someone was it Metallica's Check the links in the uh, yeah down there. Uh, do, 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 it's honestly quite hard to. There was a ridiculous list of them. There you go. Even that. 
I think that's just a, a rough idea of who's all on it, and you'll see here. I'm gonna mute this so we don't get any good idea. Good idea. Fifty-three artists covering their favorite songs. Unlimited possibilities. I Not mean, true. Yeah. All profits Wait. go to charity. Right. Okay. Fair play. Uh, are we gonna get a list? Oh, Ooh. you just skipped it. Sorry. Jesus Christ! What are you doing? Ghost. Oh. Mike DeMarco's a weirdo. Rena oh. Samaya is a strange one. Weezer's strange. Jason Isabel's a strange one. Royal Blood. Be interesting. Saint Vincent. Uh, yeah. Perfect Clyro. Sure. Off. I don't know who. Any... Corey Taylor. Well, you expect Kids Corey the elephant. Yeah. <laughs> And been presented in a weird order. So, st chasing status. Yeah. So many. Ha, ha, ha. I know. So many weird, weird bands. They're weird choices, to be honest. Yeah. But like, I mean, for me, like, I don't know who most of these people are. I'm the same, so. and that's why I'm like, Idols will be interesting. Melda May is an interesting Aye. one. She's another kind of rockabilly singer, isn't she? Yeah. Melda May. I've saw her live. Yeah. I saw her at Hebfest on Stornoway when I was working and she played the same no the day before I saw her run rig. Right. She's really good. She's, she's I got really shouted good. at by someone from Stornoway at the festival because I wouldn't let them out the disabled exit despite not being disabled and they kept screaming about how I should just go home and get my gyro. I bet you're going to go home and get your gyro you fucking scabby bastard. And, that's part, and I was like okay enjoy your walk. <laughs> <laughs> I can go out this gate and you can Bye. <laughs> Oh, nice. Yeah, um, trying their best to wind me up. I was just like, goodbye. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, kind of sad news, but let's go on to some sadder news. Um, Blink 182's Mark Hoppus has been diagnosed with cancer. He came out essentially saying he's scared of it. Yeah. Um, in a story that he then deleted. Um, it's, a, it's a weird one covering this, isn't it? Because, like, obviously he put the story up and then changed his mind about coming out with it, but you. You can't let you can't put the genie back in the bottle at that point. So then you know suddenly everybody is um, all the news outlets are posting about it like it's a well it is a news story, but posting about it like an official statement has been released. And I guess an official statement kind of was released, but yeah, this uh, it's, it's hard like, hard to read, hard to see him like this. I'll bring bring him up. Absolutely, I think in my mind what he was trying to do was let the fans know, and it's became a news story, and it's went from being like people yeah. being interested and in showing support to being some sort of media circus, and that's probably where he's went. Nah, I'm out. Yeah, though uh, the thing I like about I've only just noticed this actually. The thing I like about this picture, he's uh, he's looking looking frail and glad that he's getting treatment. Notice he's got a little little jewel sense in his hand, a PS Five controller. <laughs> I thought he had a football yeah. on his lap. Yeah, I oh, good on him. Yeah, so um, I'm not gonna say well, it's not all that bad for him. At least he's got his hands on a PS Five. Um, no. It was awful, awful to read. Like awful to read because um, there's nothing worse than knowing that someone's going for a hard time, and there's nothing worse than knowing someone's going for a hard time and they say in their statement that I'm scared. It's, it's visceral, isn't it? Like yeah. he's, he's so honest. Yeah. yeah, I'm scared and it sucks. I think was one of the sentences. Yeah, uh, fucking, we can, I'll, I'll read we, it out. Yeah, for the past three months, I've been undergoing chemotherapy for cancer. I have cancer. It sucks and I'm scared. And at the same time, I'm blessed with incredible doctors and family and friends to help get me get through this. I still have months of treatment ahead of me, but I'm trying to remain hopeful and positive. Can't wait to be cancer free and see you all at the next concert and hopefully in the near future. Love to you all. Sad. It's fucking horrible. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And you were you were listening to that album what last week? Mm -hmm. Listening to quite a few. It just hit the blank albums. They just hit their um, what twenty fifth anniversary on that album or something like that? Maybe twentieth anniversary. Something like that. Aye. Um. Yeah. Twentieth anniversary for it. Uh. Like the Skip day after the we views. were talking about it. So um. Skipped yeah. in the fuels. Uh, yeah. Um, sad one. Do you want to get on to... Should we, should we have a fight? Yes. Let's have a fight. Let's get the tension out. <laughs> uh, looking forward to this. So, um, I actually don't really know anything about this product. So, tell me about the product first, and then we'll go with the, the actual kind of story side of it. <sighs> I don't know that much either, man. I'm not really that big on boss pedals. However, this is a boss tone bender. Yeah. Which was the TB2W, the Waza Craft remake, and I believe it's a... You had made comment on the podcast before about, like, uh, what the scalpers are going to be buzzing about this these new Waza Crafts. Oh, Hunters, man. So... Anything that comes out, like, it's like, we're going to buy them, and we're going to sell them for however much more. Yeah. Um. Now, the Tone Bender, I believe, is quite a rare one, because it was based on a Fender circuit or something. I'm not sure, but there's a reason it's super, super limited and people chase after them. Now, like all of these pedals, whether you intend to play them or not, there will always be people that will go out and buy them 
yes. with the intent of selling them on. Yes. That is the nature of business. That happens whether that's individuals or businesses that do so buy to sell to make profit. Yep. A friend of ours and a friend of the show. Yeah. I'll not name them. It's I will. It's Ross McClellan. Right, we're going okay. to see his name. It's going to ah, gonna okay. come up. Fair, you know? I'm, I'm trying to stop the inevitable horde of people that maybe disagree with us. Well, one of us. Well, yeah, that's that. I think that's the, the, the thing with this, though. Like, um, I was looking forward to talking about it because it is someone that's involved with the show. In fact, I could have yeah. drove over to his house and got the pedal and had it on the show. I'm you sure. did say that just before that you wish you had. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't because I'd have been tempted to then take it and put it on eBay. <laughs> Sorry, Ross. <laughs> um... Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm totally not gonna gonna hide his name. In fact, he may be on the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club. Like he's, he's possibly he aye. often shows up. Um, you know what? It's funny when I first saw the post, I didn't realize it was Russ. Yeah, and then I saw it, and I was like, that changed the context for me a wee bit. Sure, but also at the same time, it didn't change how I solely felt on initial reaction. Yeah. So, how much is Ross asking for this pedal? Oh well, how much did it retail for? I believe at retail they were three hundred pounds or so. Okay. Not far off that anyway. Sounds about right, yeah. And Ross was asking for fifteen hundred, I believe. Yeah, just a little over actually, if if my memory serves me right. Because I thought it was a really odd number, which made me think uh one thousand five hundred and twelve. <laughs> right. Is he maybe just put that in as a placeholder kind of thing? No, because it's like don't like the price, don't comment type thing. Like, Unless it was fifteen hundred pound for the pedal and twelve pound for postage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in which case, good on you. Can't argue with that, Russ. Yeah. You get in there. So, like, you you raised an interesting point there when you when you raised uh, when you realised who it was because you, you said it changed your thoughts on things. And I obviously have to put my hands up and say, like, because I know Ross, I've taught Ross, um, and I like Ross. That will absolutely impact the way I'm going to perceive something like this absolutely totally. will, will impact the way that totally. I'm, I'm going to see something it like totally this. changed even the first message i sent to you when i sent you the screenshot yeah because i went to say that and i went that's local i know that name yeah. and i clicked the profile and i'm like fuck that's ras and then i was like right maybe i'll change how i'm going to put this forward because usually i would be like scalping dirty bastards <laughs> which i mean i still kind of feel that way but i also sure. don't want to give ras a hard time because i know him personally and i like him and i get the impression this isn't the kind of thing he does often or it's not I don't know. It's not like he's like the same kind of person you see sitting outside the barras. Or oh, sorry, um, like I, I the, the Barrel Angeli in Glasgow yeah. when gigs are on sure. scalping tickets left, right, and centre. Because that was the first thing you came back to me when I, when I said. In fact, I'll tell you what. I'll, we'll, I'll read, we'll read exactly. I read what I said to you. Read it because we'll both get heightened by the fact that we're repeating what we said. Yeah. So I said. Um, uh, guitarists are, guitarists really... are really behind the trend on this whole supply and demand thing if you buy something that has a low supply but the demand for it is insane enough to consider selling then you sell it for the demand you not you don't just sell it to break even and i said you don't see the same issue on the collectible card scene right um because of course i play magic the gathering mm -hmm. um and i have a vast collection of cards and some of them are worth some decent fucking money no i've doubt. got cards in my collection that i could sell for upwards of 600 pounds um no problem and that's mad because it's just a bit of paper a bit, a bit of cardboard um and i have absolutely bought some cards to profit off i've absolutely bought cards knowing that they are likely to go up in value gone the only thing i want to see in comparison to using magic the gathering cards versus pedals is uh -huh. you can buy clones of pedals that do the same thing with nowhere near the same price bracket you can't buy a clone of a card you just have a fake um well, uh, I mean, that, that that, there's, a, there's a complicated discussion on that because you can buy fake cards. Of course and, you, yeah, can. you can. Um, but it doesn't you... change how it's used. Uh, how, hang on, say, say that again. How do you mean? So if you, well, if you buy a clone of a pedal, you don't have to spend 1500 quid. Sure. Right? You can get exactly the same from it minus the profiteering kind of thing. Yes. I think with... Well, I suppose you could do it with fake cards as well. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Right, yeah. never mind. I'll, well, I'll but, redact but, my last comment. But you made it... You did, I think you did make an interesting and fair point there because... Um, I think that you can confidently buy a tone bender, like a clone of a tone bender that will be identical to. Mm -hmm. You could potentially even buy tone benders that are an improvement upon. I think there is a Behringer that does the same. It's basically mm. the same circuit. Yeah. And so that's when you raise that, when you point that out to me, I can't then go, huh. So people like Ross have taken up all of the supply of this sound. No one now has access to the sound unless they pay this ridiculous price. That's not the case. And I think that's not. why this doesn't upset me all that much mm -hmm. because it's a difficult one for me because I don't know what this pedal is. And obviously when the price for something goes to a certain height, I'm just like, cool, I'm not interested in it type thing. Read it up. Hold on. What's that? Are you looking for the for the retail price? Tone bender. No, I'm going to tell you what the... Uh, it's a fuzz. 
Tone yeah. Bender's a fuzz. Sure. The uh, Tone Bender, among the iconic fuzz pedals. Yeah. It would be what, a Rotor Sound originally? Rotor Sound? Did they make the, the original Tone Bender? Could have been. Like a kind of long shoe yeah. shaped pedal. Hold on. I'm just trying to get this loaded and I'll read you what it says about it, right? <laughs> okay. Boss and Solar Sound have come together to introduce the TB2W Tone Bender, the authentic sonic recreation of the iconic Tone Bender Mark II fuzz pedal used by some of the greatest guitarists of all time. Heard on legions of classic tracks from the 1960s through today, the Tone Bender's bold, rich voice and smooth sustain are forever embedded in an the annals of rock and pop music history. Using a masterpiece Tone Bender Mark II, serial number 500 from Solar Sound's archive, as a benchmark reference, Boss engineers have fully realised the pedal... The pedal's magical sound, an expressive dynamic response through detailed Waza craftsmanship. Available in a limited production run, each TB2W, they're always dead easy to name, Yeah, <laughs> it features rare germanium transistors carefully tested for optimum tone, a three-way voltage selector, selectable true buffer bypass operations, and a refined circuit design for ultra-consistent performance from pedal to pedal. Yeah. So... I mean, there's a obviously there's a huge discussion just around stuff like that, right? And the, mm -hmm. and there's the idea of like the that pedals back then were somehow better than pedals now, and people will will accept that as true because they love the recordings that those pedals were on. But there's so much more that goes into why you love those recordings. Same as people buy new old stock fucking valves and cryo treated yeah. valves. Yeah. Or oh, I've got to have a, a vintage Gibson Les Paul because you know they just sound better when they're older. That's why all those old records sound so great. Motherfucker, when those guys recorded on those guitars, they were brand fucking new. <laughs> Straight out of the box. Yep. So the, the, that's like marketing speak to the to the nth degree. Of course it is. Um, We've taken an exact replica of an old pedal, but somehow made it better. Like, well, you can't make it better if it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I'm going to concede to your point as well, though. You do, you, you raise fair points when you talk about scalping with tickets. Like, when I was talking to you via message about it, there was definitely a degree of trying to work out how I feel about it. I was exploring my own own feelings because I know I, I'm not suddenly okay with scalpers. Oh. Um, because the way I see it is a scalper is selling an access to an experience that fans will have absolutely wanted. And that fear of missing out on that, that experience, and it's literally missing out because once it's gone, it's gone. It's not like you'd be able to pick it up down the road. True. Um, that feels really predatory. I think in a scenario like this, I think we'd probably both do the same. If we had access to buy one of these, but someone at Boss came to us and was like, you know, we've put one aside if you'd like to buy it for for three hundred pounds, would you like it? I think we'd both go for it. No, oh, probably. Um, oh, uh, uh, I bet you regret selling your Korg Miku for what you sold it for. I don't remember what I sold it for, to be honest. Certainly not what they're going for now. You know, How about like they for now? 300 odd quid now. I don't think it was far off that, to be oh, honest. Okay. okay. I don't remember. I, I put it on eBay. I but... do actually remember you saying to me, because when you sold it, I was like, oh, you didn't give me first dibs on it. And you did say to me, I didn't, like, I got good money for it and I wouldn't have been able to charge you good money for it. I would, I would have asked you for any more than what yeah. I paid for it, which yeah. was yeah, yeah. washers, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> it was just the most bizarre pickup I've ever made, man. It was like a guy who stays local to me. When I worked in a music shop, he's like, I'll just walk past it and I'll drop it in. All right, no bother. There you go, mate. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, no. Um. So, it, it, can he slag Rass? But also, can he condone sure. Rass? You know where I'm at with this? Like, I 100%. like him personally. I've only really met him once, if not a handful of times. Once, certainly once where I really spoke to him, which is when we went to see... Oh, he was at the Thank Thank Scientist. Scientist gig. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I was chatting away to him about his kombucha and stuff. Yeah. Him and Thomas. And a... Uh, it was, it was Tom Kearney that was with him, I don't remember. I believe it was Tom. I've only just remembered Thomas, that he Thomas, was at that gig Tom. when you said that. Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Well, we're talking away for ages, man. It was really cool to get a good chat with him. Seems like a lovely guy. Very knowledgeable, very about yourself. Yeah. Um, you know what I think maybe exacerbated my reaction? The amount I've seen of people doing it with graphics cards recently. Sure. Graphics cards, because there is a global chip yeah. shortage. Yeah. Graphics cards have been released and released and released. And I swear to God, everybody in their granny has got a fucking... RTX 3090 yeah. in their bedroom yeah. I just got it as a wee spare and I'm just yeah. uh, well demand for those is going up as well because of crypto right Um, not those cards specifically okay. they are not great for mining I don't think really well a lot of the cards that that will be contributing to the, the uh, component shortage yes yeah. yes that's fair okay Um, it doesn't help any that despite not even in, like fulfilled most of the orders for the last ones they let out they yeah. brought out uh, TIs which are like a uh, improved versions of right, the cards okay. and then another one that's another budget one that smashes everyone else at the park and for sellers it's great because anybody that's got an old graphics card is getting silly money for it for anybody that doesn't have a gpu or is looking to buy a new one good, good fucking luck, luck. same <laughs> as playstation 5s and xboxes yeah, yeah. when they came out yeah. and 
I take another PS5 in a heartbeat. Um, and I think I saw one for almost retail. If it was not retail price, it was like five pounds over. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't contact the guy. And the reason I didn't contact the guy is because I know the demand for them is so ridiculously high that I didn't believe it could be a genuine ad. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. If um, you see one going for roundabout market price, please let me know. Yeah. Uh, not market price, sorry, the RRP. Yeah. Because... If I see one going for a retail price, I want another one. <laughs> what do you want another one for? Well, so I've got one in my bedroom, but you I want one, one in my living room. room. Yeah. Well, if you find a third, please let me know and I can pass that on to my neighbour because he's been looking for one since Christmas. Yeah. Not looking intently, but like, uh, I am not paying silly money for sure. it. Sure. And if... the games aren't even really that good for it yet. Honestly, mate, like, uh, I've owned the PS5 since the day it came out and there is no reason to buy one. There I'm is, totally... honestly, uh, there are some incredible experiences like Astro's, uh, Ad- uh, Astro's Playroom, whatever the Astro game is that comes stock on it, which is really a showcase of how cool the controller is and the cool stuff the controller can do. Mm-hmm. There's almost no reason to actually own one at this stage. Games are starting to trickle through. Returnal is out. I've not played it yet. It might be fantastic, but still, it's just not enough of a reason to own a PS5 yet, Did other it... than the fear of missing out. I don't think there is any argument to be made for owning a launch day console in the last couple of years yeah just know yeah if games had actually come out for it then this would have been a wonderful example of why get one on release day right because nobody had any idea they were going to be this hard to get hold of um i you know evidently i was extremely lucky to get one on on release um i didn't feel that way because i set an alarm and i pre-ordered it the second the pre-orders went up right um, I would have taken it even more fucking seriously if I knew it was going to be this fucking bad. Aye. So um, absolute insanity. Um, I did reach out to Ross though. Yes, um, you did. Because I wanted to see if he had any any comment, anything he wanted to say. I said I'll obviously be fighting his corner on the show. Um, but you didn't. You well, bastard. You backstabbed him. <laughs> no. So I do support what he what he's done here because uh-huh. the other thing we we have to take into consideration. Like, I'm not going to go into Ross's personal circumstances, but for all we know, let's say there's a reason Ross needs money. But that's none of our business. I don't he, care well, whether he's the richest guy or the poorest guy in the planet. But well, my my point is, like, it's hard to make a living out there. Oh, know? of course. Like, yeah. that kind of goes back to the point I was making before. Since the start of lockdown, the number of people I have seen who have turned to that, like, buying Yeezys, buying them, like, limited edition trainers yeah. and selling them on and whatever else, like, if that's your hustle, fucking wire in. Yeah. Like, fill your boots, make a fortune off it, do what you need to do. I'm just a bit more conflicted when it comes to musical equipment, I think, because there's a bit more of a... Because you're a musician? Because there's passion in it, rather yeah. than it just being yeah. straight commerce. Yeah. I can't even say I haven't bought a guitar to flip it. That would be a fucking lie. Yeah. An entire terrible lie. I've bought equipment to flip plenty of yeah. times. And uh, there's always the dream, isn't there? I think, if I'm honest with myself, the reason I love going in charity shops and things like that is because you're hoping you find an incredible deal. Oh, a 50 Esquire. Yeah. Oh, it's... Pristine, it's perfect. Oh, you want forty quid for it? Like, I right, I'll give you forty five. There you go. Put that in the tin. Yeah, and if I picked up something like that, there's no fucking way I'm gonna have that on my wall as the guitar that I got for forty quid. Like, I'm getting rid of it as soon as possible because there's the possibility there to to not life changing. I don't believe you. If it was a Telecaster, of that, I'll... if it was a Telecaster, yeah, I guess. Okay. <laughs> if, if if you were saying you were like on a, on a gold top, or a gold top, a yeah. good gold top, I think you would yeah. be all over. Yeah, yeah. But for talking sake, let's say it's a a tufel. Right, we're lucky enough to get a fucking wire fish or whatever the fuck they're called. Yeah, pig fish. If, I, if there was a deal, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make some money on it because, uh, you know, money is hard to come by. <laughs> and I guess like, the reason I don't feel bad for things like this is because it's all supply and demand. Like Ross isn't twisting anyone's arm into buying this. And when we have drawn attention to like. You know, ch- we we were going to run Chances Answers, and this is technically the first episode of Chances Answers. I suppose I because yeah. we can as a soft break, isn't it? And he he's absolutely a chancer in this. Like he doesn't know if it's going to sell. He's got a feeling it might sell for somewhere around the grand, and he'd be he'd be more than happy with that type thing. Don't put his price at you, mad man. Anyway, undercut him by five hundred quid. Well, whoops. Um, <laughs> well, Ross, you just have to stick to your guns now and take fifteen hundred for it. I can't. He might have actually said it will go for fifteen hundred. I won't read out his exact quote on it, but um point is uh we've we've talked about things that we think are being sold on reverb uh, overpriced things before and it's very rarely a case of we think the seller's a scumbag it's more an informing the consumer like that we in our opinion this price is a little bit high and i probably if you hold out the price will come down on these that's the problem with things like this the reason i've got magic cards that i could sell for 600 pounds for a bit of fucking cardboard is because demand is high and people when prices start to creep up and the demand for a card goes up 
people keep paying the inflated price, which just mm -hmm. pushes the price up further and further. I'm holding on to these cards until they get to get to silly values, um, and I still play them. Like it's not like they're sat in a folder. I'm using all the cards, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, as consumers in a scenario like this, if we all just looked at this and went, "Nope, not having it, not buying it," then it would be fine. But what I said to you in our messages is inevitably in a scenario like that, when we should be essentially forming our own little union and, and working together as one, somebody breaks ranks. Yes. And then when one person breaks ranks, then somebody else is like, oh, I'll try and get one too. And it's just impossible. You just can't control the way people are. Human beings are selfish in nature and yeah. that's the gist of it. But we are by nature selfish. We have to be. That's how we survived in the wild. Uh, Quite simple. The reason I thought this would be fun though is because Ross said to me that uh, he had a power of widows. Yeah, he said that he will send some funny messages that people are sending him about the pedal, which is that an interesting alternative perspective on this, isn't it? Because it's one thing for us to look at like a reverb seller that's selling something like a Dumble for a price that we think is ridiculous or whatever it happens to be. It's another step entirely to reach out to that seller and start sending them abuse. You know, not that I'd say Ross is getting abuse, but you know. I kind of agree with his comment. When you sell something, if you advertise something for sale and, and people don't want to pay the price, just move on. Like, cool, that's that's not for me. And I've had posts removed from groups because I'm either trying to buy something for, for what people think is too low a price or I'm trying to sell something for what people think is too high a price. And it's like, the market will decide. Like, if I put up an ad in one of my magic groups saying I'd like to find this card for £30, has anyone got one? And people want to sell them for 50 they can either reach out to me and say, I've got one, I'll do you for 50 or they can go, no thanks, I'll keep my card. Mm -hmm. But for them people to get involved and be like, well, you know, you'll have better luck if you, if you go for a more realistic price. In the example I'm thinking about, despite the fact that comments got turned off on my post, somebody reached out to me and told me the card that I wanted for the price that I wanted to pay. Cool. I wouldn't have been offended if, if nobody had the product that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I had a price I wanted to pay for something and I got what I wanted if I didn't that's just nature of the beast and it's the same for buying things I, I don't mind I, I honestly don't see a problem in someone trying to be a helpful third person and either say you because I've seen it myself doing it as well like you've priced this far too low yes. versus you've priced this maybe a bit high and sometimes people don't know how to go and search the value of things the that's easiest it. way to do it eBay advanced sold listings and put in what you want Right. and whatever it's sold for on average, say the first 10 or the last 10 sales, most recent 10 sales, you're going to get a good idea what the market value is for it. Yep. There'll be the occasional one that's 100 quid cheaper or 50 quid cheaper, yep. but you get a lay of the land of what you should be asking for it and what condition it's in and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's when I try and step in and help people sometimes. But you're right, that very quickly is either seen the wrong way by them or the moderators or turns into the shit show of ah you're a fucking idiot asking for this money I mean I, I was guilty yeah. of even saying about Ras I think MD asking 1500 quid for a pedal is it is insane they're not saying sure <laughs> right but the point clearly is as Ras has said himself and as it says in the advert like there's no other ones for sale in the UK yeah so there's every chance that it will sell I it shouldn't because anybody that's looking at considering spending 1500 pounds on this pedal you're a lunatic but then I spent hundreds of pounds on magic cards, so like, um, it's it's all what you're interested in and like what whatever you're you're poisoning. Some people have an obscene amount of money and they enjoy spending an obscene amount of money. Mm -hmm. To somebody, somebody will probably buy this pedal and love the fact that they paid fifteen hundred pound for it, and mm -hmm. they'll love the fact that they've got two hundred grand in the bank, so they could afford to spend fifteen hundred pound on it. And when they put that pedal on their board, they'll feel good about the fact that they spent fifteen hundred pounds on it. Like it's and they'll take that and their PRS and their Mark V and their two one by twelve steel cabs. You leave Tyler their, Larson alone. And their G major. I, I was going to say the opposite. And their G major pedal board, or the the whatever the fucking unit is, the TC systems, the one that Steve oh, I the, used. The, the G unit. Uh, is the G unit yeah, into it? Yeah. Uh, the fucking Ali G number, the G unit, and <laughs> all these pedals and all that, and then they'll play in a pub to fifty people. Yeah. And if that's what it takes, and then that's what it takes. It's I'm just, just being a bad bastard. Yeah. I, I like what you said, though, because you're talking about this idea of like, um, if there can be that misinterpretation. When I put something up, like I, there was a card in that pile that I thought was one type of card. I thought it was a foil card. It's not. It's an etched foil card. I put it up trying to get 50 for it, and the market value for it is actually about 25. So someone said, I labeled it as a foil, and they said, actually, I think this is the etched foil. And I was like, oh, cool my mistake and i took the post down like easy the problem is because i wouldn't try and charge more than what it was what it was worth um you have to be okay if somebody's reaching out to you in good faith and actually trying to help you out then cool if somebody like in ross's case people are just trying to attack him for it like there's just no need for it there's just no need for it no like, i've tried my best to help. no need for it so um, but at the same time it gives us some good content where's your integrity yeah this is a uh, 
Oh no, so Ross did want £1,512 plus £10 shipping. I'll bring this up. Um, you know, why, you, why would you contact someone who's selling something and ask them where their integrity is? It just doesn't, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand it. By all means, do what we're doing ha here now, which is make fun of it. I, I think the other thing that's mental is people who will ask for it to be sold to them at the market or, or sorry, like the Someone's RRP literally, or whatever. literally done that. And then made out like he's an asshole. Like, well, you're the asshole. You were trying to scalp it next because you saw the value. Yeah. Ben I, I don't imagine you want to buy it at that value because you think it's worth it. And we know that not to be the case because he asked for retail price for it. And then imagine being this much of a scalping prick. I mean, I mean you were just trying to take your opportunity and yeah. it didn't quite work out for you. So yeah. you're a salty scalping prick, Ben. Yeah. You knew exactly what market value was for it, and you were going for trying to get market sorry, retail value for it, so you could then shift it for market value. It's what right. people what's that next one? What people do. This is a, an astonishing take. I really like this one. You do know what's in a real tone bender, right? Actually, three to four transistors depending on the version and about 10 components. Basically, fuck all, it's a funk. There's about 10 pounds worth of parts in them. Even the reissue ones from Macaris are more boxed than parts. Yes, they may have some old Romanian transistors in them, but that itself just means they are flawed and susceptible to temperature, etc. People are stupid. Save your money and go buy a new amp for that kind of money. This he's is... not buying one, Duncan. Yeah. He's selling it, you daft cunt. That, what an astonishingly poor take. Uh, uh, that's great advice. That is great advice to somebody that's considering buying a fuzz pedal for £1,500. But you're selling that to, saying that to the person that's selling it. If I was Ross, I would have come back to him and said, you know what, that's a great idea. When I sell this pedal for £1,500, I'm going to go buy an amp with it. Oh, and also, Duncan, did you know that when you buy a £1,500 amp, it's also fuck all worth of components in it. Like these, I don't know the exact value of the components in these, G, uh, these I, G20s. I would say probably quite a lot considering the, the technology. It's, oh, it's going to be a good few hundred pounds, but it's not going to be the retail price. Oh, like, of course not. Anytime you buy something, there's a fucking markup. So yeah, like what an astonishingly poor take. There's an astonishingly big markup already on the fucking tube bender, what the fuck it's called. The tone bender. Tone bender. Because exactly that, not only is it an old design, granted they might need to spend some money to get those old Germanian transistors, right? But there's no R&D. There's yeah, no fair design. Point. That they can build whatever they want. They've already had a crazy markup and then they get an extra markup on top of them because it's an old pedal that people are chasing. So there's like five or six layers of making money on this that no one's thinking about. Yeah. Nature of the beast. It's just kind of, kind of what happens. And... I already feel as if the Waza craft essentially is them saying, we're scalping you. So for people to then buy the limited edition ones and fire it out there, it's just like, scalp with us. I actually do completely agree with you on that. I completely agree with you on that. The only one that I felt different about, I think, was the Dimension C, and it's because it's such a rear pedal. Or the chorus with the buttons on it. Sure. Is, sure. is that Dimension C? I'm not sure. I'm sure it has four different choruses or whatever. But the the, the uh, exact model number doesn't I'm spring I'm sure that's what it's called, and I'm sure um, it sticks in my mind because it is weird. Just, it's but funny. that's it. craft uh, even... When they did the was it the HM two, yeah, and the group, and it was like the group was all for these suggestions and whatever else, and then they just went whatever they wanted. Yeah, but the suggestions were all like, no, we want this, we want that. Yeah, well, here's it, you're good. Yeah. It's it's just a difficult conversation for me because like I have so many pedals, still don't have a power supply. I'd just throw that out there, guys. Like, I still haven't plugged pedals in in months. If anyone's selling one, let them know. Bradley is uh is selling one, and we talked about buying it, and then nothing came of it. And I could follow up on that, and like I absolutely should. Maybe I'll do that today. Yes, um, you should. But I'm doing all right without pedals at the moment, you know, I'm I'm, I'm surviving. Um, I'm point is, getting by. even when I have my pedals, like, I'm I'm good because I have my pedals. I know what, what I have and I'm happy with the sounds that I can get out of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not constantly looking for new things. And really the cure for, for wanting to spend £1,500 on a, on a pedal is learning that that £1,500 won't make you sound £1,500 better. <laughs> I don't think anyone is spending the £1,500 expecting a better sound. There is not a single part of me that thinks that whoever is going to buy this from Ras is interested in how it sounds plugged in. That will not leave the box. Let's be honest. That is an investment in their mind. Yes. I, I think I Especially think I with it being, as Russ has put it himself, or Ras, sorry, the only one he could find for sale in the UK. Yes. If he finds somebody that wants it that badly somebody could probably still profit on whatever it's sold to them at mm. i am going to do something that you don't see me do very often on this podcast now 
and that's, be nice. Well, I kind of said it at, at, at the start when we started on this subject, where I talked about like I'm going to have an inherent bias on this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think actually, like I'm, I am a screaming hypocrite on this though, because I know who's selling it. I take less issue with it, and I and I know that to be the case actually because. The fact I've, that you've reached out and spoke to him rather than being like, come on, you fuck. Well, no, I just, I hate people. I do hate like PS5 scalpers that have got 30 of them, you know, and they're using bots to get as many as they can. And I hate people like that, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I also don't think very highly of people that manage to get a second one and then try and sell it at a markup of like, you know, double the price. If you've got a PS5 that retails for £450 and you're trying to sell it for £800, you're a scumbag. Like, in my opinion, you're, you're a scumbag. If I could get my hands on a second one, um com completely honest with you if i could get my hands on a second one um that wasn't for myself i would buy it for retail price and i would then pass it on to someone that wants it for for retail price mm -hmm. because that uh, that's just kind of who i am um i wouldn't take massive issue with buying a second one at 50 pounds over the retail price mm -hmm. if, if there was one going i would take that um but yeah to blind like them. massive profiteering on on them i would if it was a a, P a single ps5 i guess i would go asshole so the only reason I'm not saying asshole here is because I know who's selling it. So that does make me a screaming hypocrite, unfortunately. But the human condition is a complicated one. I already said that before. Like yeah. I, I totally get that the context yeah. of how I felt or my reaction, not yeah. even how I felt, my reaction, yeah. my actual knee-jerk reaction changed. Yeah. And maybe the thing I should class. be taking from that is actually maybe I need to think a little bit more about how I feel about someone selling a PS5. <laughs> because the, if I take into in, into consideration the human element behind that rather than the business element, maybe my opinion changes. It's it's a difficult one. Um, but I'm definitely interested to know, to know what people in the comments um, have to say about this one and what people want to say on the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club. Let us know in that comment section. I mean, I, I imagine Ross has been dragged for this pretty, pretty relentlessly. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope it sells for him. I also hope nobody is silly enough to pay £1,500 for a pedal. For society. <laughs> if, if they think that it's going to improve their tone, absolutely. If it's the same as, to use the quotes or, or the uh, the examples he's used, King of Tones, Clones. Is it going to sound better than Michelangelo Battier's tone on Superstition? That is the real question. I, I suppose I. I mean, I, I would pay 1500 quid never to hear that. The only question that ever matters. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, that was enjoyable. Um, what can I add to this? Did you know... This show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars. We want to remind you guys that there is still time to get involved in the upcoming Run 16 guitars. Those include these incredible hypes available in five new colours. That Dragon Burst is absolutely stunning. You can also get your hands on one of the Metal X's, again available in a range of finishes. My personal pick has to be these headless Vs. Absolutely outrageously cool. Imagine one of those in an 8-string. I absolutely love these. And finally, the Ando San Signature Model, available in 6, 7, and 8-string availability. Go and check them out at Ormsby's website right now. This show is also brought to you by our friends over at Rev Amplification, a one-stop shop for all of your tonal needs. Head on over to their website to check out their range of lunchbox amplifiers, both the D20 and G20, 20-watt 20 amplifiers with built-in two-notes torpedo technology so you can record direct into your computer. If that doesn't suit, you can also check out one of their highly popular G2, 3, and 4 pedals, giving you that trademark Rev tone in a stomp box. Incredible tones, I use these myself. And finally, you may notice in the back of these videos, a Rev Generator 120, an absolute masterclass in modern electric guitar tones. Check it out at their site now. So as always, a huge thanks to our friends and family over at both Ormsby Guitars and Rev Amplification. Please do go and check them out. Uh, we were tagged in something on Instagram just today from somebody, um, a, f a, f a fan of the show, friend of the, oh, who did it? Who posted it? Was it not Phil Cross? I think it was Phil. But his Instagram was, uh, name Jim is Gump. yes. It was Phil Winter. Yeah, yeah, it's Phil. Shout out to Phil. Shout out to all you. Thanks very much for all the support and the fact that we get tagged in things and there's there's multiple comments, emails, messages. You know whatever saved uh, sent to us or stuff left on YouTube and whatever. Sorry, I cut you yeah. off. What were you going to say? I was just going to say essentially that like it means a lot. It's it's cool to cool to see it and and I know that um well it probably doesn't mean so much to Ormsby. I guess it reassures them that they are doing the right thing by partnering with us, which is, uh, you know, I, never a bad thing. I don't know as much, man. I, I quite like to think we've got a really good relationship, not just with the company arms, but with Perry himself. Yeah. We chat back and forth quite a lot of the time, don't we? Really? Yeah. I mean, even just this morning. Yeah. And that's where we found out that the Thousand Guitars is due to, that's crazy, isn't it? Due to land. Yeah. I said to him, like, on, on the one hand, like, I'm really, really happy for him. 
thousand guitars there's a lot of cool guitars to, to go through and start shipping out to people going to make a lot of customers very happy but but also from that perspective of like imagine running a business where you've got a team of people and you're like right guys tomorrow we've got a thousand guitars coming in to the factory we need to quality control every single one of them it's like 150 guitars each if there's like six of them yeah which is a big job brutal. really really like big but job. they're all very good at it sure yeah. i've not had a guitar from them that I've had any question about and that's yeah. not to say that other people have all had super sparkling issues I don't think any company gets it right first time it's how it's dealt with yeah for what I've seen things go pretty smoothly which is mm. what we want yeah what we want um, so there's the Richie Allens and then there's going to be the yeah, Rusties I actually didn't even ask Perry what the the thousand guitars are uh, so there'll be the Richie Allens do you think do you think the one that I've asked for is coming in no why it'll be the Richie Allens because it's the way the runs have done they've not been built yet listen there's the Richie Allens, okay. there's the Rusty Coolies, there's the Dinos, there are TXs, classic, there's a couple of exotic hypes, there's the Floyd Rose Metal Xs and Metal Vs, and I can't remember what else is there, but the next one after that that's due to get done is the one with the Joseph Haley Psychroptic signatures, which sure. are, by the way, fucking, oh, finish on them. Um, and then after that, I think, is the ones that you're after. I believe okay. it's run 16. So, well, they were... I was under the impression they were coming in much sooner because they were they were ordered and, and not announced. Oh, maybe. Maybe I've got the wrong end then. You know, the... I don't know. Oh, well, I mean, they know that... Everyone knows that there's Ormsby Evertunes coming. Aye. I can I mean, say that, but I can't say the colour that, that, that I've asked for. So. <laughs> the new website, by the way, you've been on it? Yes. Very nice, isn't it? Nice it's very sleek. It's been good. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I want to add. Uh, oh, um, just an additional actually actual thought on the Kiesel thing that we were talking about last week. Uh huh. Because um, there's a lot of misinformation going around on that. Oh really? Yeah. What's been happening? Well, people are trying to throw Jeff under the bus maybe a little bit more than than he deserves to be. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm okay with throwing Jeff under the bus when Jeff needs to be thrown under the a bus or something. Has it, has it been attributed that he has some kind of genuine homophobe what's now? being reported from a lot of people is that the guy mike changed the thing and jeff fired him for that and that wasn't the case no i don't go much. to mike's personal facebook page and read his post and he explains exactly what happened mm -hmm. he worked his notice without giving his notice he you know he, he did everything that you would expect to do as part of your notice um, he Without actually serving it. passed on all of these, all of the all the clients to the person that was going to be dealing with him. He reached out to the magazines that he was dealing with them, introduced him to the new guy, all of those things, and then um, told Jeff on the day that that he was uh, that he was leaving and he was out, type thing. So he quit and did that on the way out of the door. He absolutely did not do it and was fired for it. That's not how that happened. But most people seem to be reporting it that way, and there is a slight difference between those two things, and it is worth pointing out. Like I say, happy for Jeff to to take some flack when he deserves it, but I don't think he deserves to be accused of firing someone for supporting the LGBT community. Uh, I don't uh, think that's the case. Uh, In fact, no, it's not the case. It's but. a questionable one, isn't it? Yeah. So what they've got at the moment on the pre-orders open and closed are the Goliath GTR Sharks, the Goliaths, Dino Cazares, the Rusty Coolies, and then nothing about the ones you're talking about. The current open pre-orders are the TX GTR Vintages, the Carbons, the Exotics... And then the Joe Haley, which is run 15 and then upwards. But you might be right. It might well, be that Perry's just went, yeah. well, actually, we just bought them and that will be that. Yeah, no, I can, because I can, I'm going to throw a number out there. The number might be off. I'm pretty sure the number is off. Um, but if memory serves me right, Perry ordered them as a custom thing to come in and then to sell. And the mm -hmm. reason I'm pushing so hard to get, get one is because I believe there's only 20 of them. Oh, okay. That's why I wanted one. I and they're, they're not it's not a pre-order anything no it's just like a it's yeah special they're just dropping them as a surprise type thing um, all right okay fair so, enough and i really want one because you know love and ever tune me yes you do <laughs> uh anything you would like to close the show with mike just the usual man thanks very much to everybody who's given us their time on this beautiful monday evening um if you haven't liked your video make sure you're subscribed Make sure you've got us on SoundCloud if you want to hear us on the move. We're also on pretty much every other podcasting app you can think of. If we aren't, get us told and we'll make sure we get on it. Big thanks to Ormsby. Big thanks to Rev. Big thanks to all of you yet again for, for listening. Thanks to anybody who has even taken the effort of looking at the Buy Me A Coffee. I'm glad you just said that because I was going to bring that up on screen and say we'll be doing a bonus episode next week. Yes, we will be. Um, the bonus episodes so far have been fun, but not a massive amount of engagement on them. But... Um, 
Well, I mean, we, we have maybe 15 supporters on Buy Me A Coffee. It's not a lot of people. No, I feel. Um, so I wouldn't expect massive engagement on them. But, you know, if you're listening to the podcast now and you're thinking, only 15 people support them on Buy Me A Coffee. Well, I'm going to head on over to the Buy Me A Coffee. I'm going to give them $1. And in exchange for that $1, I'm going to get access to currently two bonus episodes with another one coming next week. Mm-hmm. What a great way to spend a dollar. Hundred percent, and we're not putting anything else behind paywalls or that. It's, this is just us asking if you want to support us and you can afford it, and you'd yeah. like to do so, please do. I'm also toying with the idea, and I'm, you know, this is something I should really run by the by the uh, the buy me a coffee members. Uh huh. Um, but I think maybe like three months after a bonus episode has gone up behind a paywall, we could probably put it public. I would think that's fair. I don't I don't think think anybody's going to take any issue with it. They're not necessarily um, related to the yeah. actual content. They're sometimes yeah. a bit. Well, what's it been like? A, a yeah. me teaching you refs and you teaching me yeah. some some licks, some Pat yeah. Martino. Yeah. So, and there's some great content in there, and like I we never want to hide anything from anybody. We want that's you right. to be able to see everything that we do, and you know, uh, I hate the idea of someone genuinely not being able to afford to access that bonus content at all, and they're not being able to see it either because they literally have no money, or maybe because they're. 14 years old and they don't have access to a credit card or something like that you know so um, if, if we're we... cutting half the episode off for that I would be pretty past. yeah so. I'd be pretty past myself so I totally yeah. but yeah big thanks to everybody thanks once again Good. Um, Teespring link will be down below as well so if you want to buy a t-shirt if you don't just want to give us some money for essentially nothing we totally res- uh, respect that that's the kind of route we went down to start with obviously we want people to get things back for their money so if you do wish to have a wee look the t-shirts are not bad they're actually really good quality especially the premium ones Um. Levi might end up doing a pro-piracy run. We never know. Can't bring myself to do it. Nah. Unfortunately, too much integrity. <laughs> you see that Misha's got a new signature guitar? Nah. Oh, uh, a Charvel? Uh, what, a Strat type thing? Ah, DK24. Yeah. yeah. We talked about it on the show before. It was it existed, mm-hmm. um, but then you went to the website and it was it, uh, 404. It's just... It's, yeah. Yes. Here's Got my signature for that, that brand money. I don't use and that guitar I've never used. Money. Money. <laughs> Mike, until next time. Fuck the Tories. Now go to end. <laughs>